Hello and welcome to the World Wanderers Podcast, your source for travel stories, travel destinations, and travel philosophy. I'm Amanda. I'm Ryan. And we're your hosts. Welcome back for another episode of the World Wanderers Podcast. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by you, the listeners of the show. We are so, so grateful for every single person who supports us over at Patreon. If you would like to support the World Wanderers for a small amount each month and get fun rewards like postcards from over, all over the world, copies of our eBooks, and one-on-one -on -one hangouts with us, you can head on over to patreon.com forward slash the World Wanderers and support us there. On this episode of the podcast, we are very excited to be sharing an interview that we did a couple weeks back on the Slow Your Home podcast, which is hosted by Brooke and Ben McCallery, who are based out of Australia. And they're going to talk a little bit about in their intro how we met and how we connected, but I'll just spoil it here and let you know that we met them at Podcast Movement in Anaheim this past August when we were there, and we immediately connected over our mutual love of travel and our mutual love of the Canadian Rocky Mountains. Um, they found out we were from Canmore, and Canmore is kind of their home away from home when they're not in Australia. So we immediately started talking, and uh, they invited us on our show, and we're very excited to be sharing this episode where we talk about our travel story, how we fell in love with travel, how our travels have shifted from more fast pace backpacking to staying in places longer, the shift of working and traveling on the road, as well as what we've learned as traveling as a couple. So without further ado, here is the episode. Hello, and welcome to the Slow Home Podcast. This is the podcast all about living a slower, simpler life in a fast-paced world, and I am Brooke McCallery. You are. I am. My name is Ben McCallery, and welcome to episode 195. In this episode, I talk to the delightful Ryan and Amanda from The World Wanderers. You do, and I don't. You don't? <laughs> I don't. I, we had scheduled a like a four-way conversation, and uh, I had a radio interview come up at the last minute, unfortunately. The so media just, uh, starlet. Yeah, yeah, that's me. I am a media hussy. <laughs> okay. So how is the book media stuff going? <laughs> Good. It's going good. It's really only just kind of ramping up. The next couple of weeks are going to be quite full mm. just with, I'm trying to keep it to just one thing a day. So even though in my head I'm saying it's full, it's not really, but yeah. I've got things it's on. just a lot of it. A lot. Yeah. yeah over every uh, like most days I have a thing on over the next couple of weeks and then we're heading off on a bit of a mini book tour up to Brisbane and doing a few events. I'm not going to bore you all with all the dates, but if you are interested to see what we've got on, and unfortunately at this time it's mostly New South Wales. We don't have anything yet booked in for anything other than Brisbane, but that may change. I'm just not sure on timing and stuff, but you head to slowyourhome.com slash events mm -hmm. and you can find all the, the details. All the deets mm -hmm. for all the events mm -hmm. running all the way through to January next year. Yeah, yeah actually I did. <laughs> Weirdly, book one for uh, the, I don't know, the second last week of January, which is a week before we leave. So <laughs> I'm sure my head will be absolutely in the game. Yeah, it's bizarre. I just wanted to highlight the State Library event, which is actually going to be a podcast. It is. It's going to be a live podcast in the State Library of New South Wales on... The 21st of October. So if you're in Sydney or if you're in Brisbane and want to buy an airfare or Melbourne or, or Canmore in Canada or... <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it might not be worth it. <laughs> probably not worth it. But yeah, if you're around, we'd love to see you at that live recording. It's a weekend. It's a Saturday. So yeah, that, that hopefully will work for some people who couldn't make a, like a midweek event because of work situations. So that will be... Fun. Yeah, that'll be that'll be. That'll Come be along, Looking bring your questions. Not entirely sure how we're going to structure it yet. Yeah. Um, but it'll absolutely be like a hostful kind of situation. Mm. So that will be fun. But anyway, go to the events page, check it out, or check it out. Check it out. On that, we spoke. Well, I spoke to the lovely Amanda and Ryan, who are the World Wanderers at theworldwanderers dot com. All the links to their socials are in. The show notes to this podcast slash one nine five on the slow your home website. Guys, these guys are 
awesome. We bizarrely met them in the US when we were over there for the podcast movement conference. I looked at the the sort of schedule and pinpointed this session about podcasting and travel. And I went, well, that's extremely relevant right now in that we're preparing for our for our trip. I need to I need to go to that session. And it was presented by Ryan and Amanda and they spoke you know about podcasting and 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 traveling and 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 the gear and the, the techniques and the the processes and I got a lot out of it and I knew that I really liked this couple straight away <laughs> there was something about them and so afterwards I said Brooke wow oh, these great session and um we bizarre we sat next to them in a, in another session and introduced ourselves and and I said oh so whereabouts in Canada are, are you from and they said, oh, about an hour out of Calgary, near Banff. And, yeah, they live in, in our home away from home, Canmore, which you guys know we've spoken about a lot of on this podcast. Which is crazy because it's only a population of like 10,000 yeah, or something. it's very, very weird. Yeah. Very weird. Yeah. <laughs> so recently we put a shout out on Facebook about topics for the rest of the year. Yes. And one of the big themes was travel. Yes. So that's the reason why we want to talk more about travel and slow travel. And these guys, I think it's really interesting because they share their their travel philosophy and it really sort of suits what we're doing as well. Yeah, these guys just seem to find a place that they, they want to spend time in and kind of put roots down for a chunk of time, kind of like we like to travel, which is one of the things that I think appealed to us when we were talking about how they travel and where. And I think it's it's really fitting with the the whole slow travel theme. And they approach it very differently because they're they don't have kids. They're quite a bit younger than us. And I think that gives a really interesting spin on the different ways you can do it. Yeah, yeah. but they're working when they're traveling, yes. so there's that added complexity and something that we're going to have to both juggle with, and then the school element with the kids. Yeah. Anyway. This in, the conversation is is a is a great one because it does it does touch on a number of themes, but also like the personal growth stories and understanding and growing with one another and the relationships. There was a cracking quote that Ryan gave during it was that you, know, you travel with someone for six months and you end up experiencing all the emotions, mm-hmm. getting rid of all the arguments that you might have over a decade just because you are living so close to one another. It's true, actually. And and there's also that theme of also being able to, to spend some time alone as well. How important that yeah, is. Yeah, so some mind, mindful activities that mm-hmm. you do, you know, as individuals um, mm. is really important as well. And having well Amanda's that- a yoga teacher. Correct. So I know she taps into the yoga mm. community mm. pretty much straight away whenever they're in a new place which I really like. Uh, that's Actually, I just want to go back to that, how intense the emotional journey oh. can be when you are traveling with someone. Like looking back at you and I when we traveled in mm. our early 20s, mm. absolutely cleared a lot of stuff out in a quite an intense 12 months. Yeah. Mm. It's amazing how much you learn from someone when <laughs> you miss a train or a bus or... It's even more amazing when they stick around. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I think let's get into it. So theworldwanderers.com is their home, away from home. The show notes over on Slow Your Home have all the links to all their social media, plus their awesome podcast. Amanda also has a podcast for yoga teachers, of which I know we have quite a few in our audience. So uh, we'll include a link to that as well. Enjoy the chat. Amanda and Ryan, hello and welcome to the Slow Home Podcast. Thank you so yeah. much. It's great to be here. Excited to be here. So for the listeners' benefit, I thought I'd just sort of touch on the background of how, how we came across you guys. You guys presented at a conference that Brooke and I recently went to, a podcast conference called the Podcast Movement in LA, and you guys presented on a topic that was of very much interest to Brooke and I, and that's all about podcasting while traveling. And not only did you guys have a cracking presentation, but you also happen to be very, very nice people. And I put that <laughs> down 
to where you live or, or that is where you reside when you're not traveling. So I thought you guys could just give us a little bit of background on, you know, what got you in to traveling the world, traveling our globe and yeah, how, how you came across and uh, one another and created the world wanderers. Yeah, definitely. So I'll have to back up a lot of years to when we first met each other. Uh, Ryan and I met in our second year of university at the University of Calgary, which is in Alberta in Canada. And we were both studying in business school, so we were on a very conventional path at that point. We continued dating throughout business school until we graduated. We decided to take post-college, post-university trips. So we'd mm. go to Europe and we go to Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand. And, you know, being Australian, I feel like you guys understand that because that's very, very typical of Australians. And it's becoming more and more popular for Canadians. And that was our first trip together. That was our first big backpacking trip. It was the first time where we were staying in hostels for a long period of time. It was the longest that I'd ever been away from home. And I was 22 at that point. And we kind of discovered this world that was a little bit foreign to us. But we came home and we got career jobs in our fields, which for me, it was marketing. For Ryan, it was finance. And we did that for a couple of years, kind of thinking this is what we're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And we hated that. So we decided to sell our stuff, quit our jobs and go backpacking in South America for six months, two years after our, our trip before that. And people thought we were a little bit crazy. They're like, what's wrong with them? What are they doing? Why are they doing this? But it was just something we needed to do for us. And we did that and we had a great trip. And when we came home, we decided to start the World Founders. And I think it was your your idea. So maybe you want to talk about that, Ryan. Yeah. So the, I, I mean, I was had been a podcast fan for the longest period of time and had this idea of like, oh, it would be cool to have a, a place where we could, um, you know, talk to interesting people, have conversations between the two of us. And then while we were traveling in South America, it was kind of reconnecting with a lot of things that I had wanted to do in the past, ideas that I had had, but, you know, no, had either talked myself out of doing or just figured out a way not to do them. And one day we were just walking on a little trek in Peru, actually. And I was like, I was listening to a, um, a interview with Pat Flynn about how he started his podcast. And I was like, you know what, we should start a travel podcast. I went and asked Amanda about it. And that's, we made the decision that day. Uh, that was over three and a half years ago now. And so we've been podcasting for three of those, almost 200 episodes as well. Congratulations. That's uh, that's awesome. So um, when, so just tracking back, going down to the South American adventure in 2013, I want to explore briefly, what was the reaction? You touched on it, Amanda. What was the reaction of your family and friends and, and colleagues? I mean, you guys, you, you quit your jobs. You're like, look, you know, this is not for us anymore or at this time, this is not for, for us. Did they understand your decision and, and sort of how did you manage those expectations, I guess, of, of family and friends of what you decided to do? I think that we were so determined to do it because we were not in a good place, like with our relationship, with the careers that we were working, we, neither of us were really happy. So we just knew that we had to go. Mm -hmm. So I think that that kind of allowed us to push through any response that we got from people, but definitely I think confusion from our family. Like mm -hmm. you already did this like gap year post university backpacking trip. Like you don't get two of those. You got one and you already did it. So what are you doing this time? And we were working like on paper, we were working good jobs, like our combined income was really good for our age. And, you know, we lived in a nice two bedroom apartment, uh, just outside of downtown in Calgary. The benefits were good. Like everything was good on paper. It just, mm. it wasn't serving us anymore. And so we just decided that that was right for us. And I think our friends were, I think some were like, oh, okay, you're going to do this again. And others were like, okay, yeah, I guess you're just traveling again. That's what you're going to do. It kind of just depended on the person mm -hmm. with that. But definitely a lot of people who were like confused or surprised or like, you shouldn't be doing this again. You already did it. <laughs> yeah. And then I think for both of us with our with our families, that was more where we got the impression that we were like straying off the path that we were supposed to be on. I remember having a conversation with my, with my dad about it. And it was just kind of one of those, he, he's a pretty not an extra communicative mm -hmm. type of person. Mm -hmm. So we, we were just having this conversation. I was like, so yeah, me and Amanda are planning to go to South America in January. And he's like, oh, okay, cool. Like how long? Six months? And it was just silence. <laughs> um, nothing more than that. So 
definitely got the impression that he was surprised and maybe he didn't feel like that was the best decision. But we had both just got to a point where we're like, this is what we're doing. Mm. And then we just told people like, hey, this is what we're doing. It wasn't it wasn't ever a thing where we were like, oh, what do you guys think about this idea where maybe other people might have had an impact or an influence on us? It was just kind of made the decision one day and then told people about it. So when you sort of talk to people about, you know, your your idea of traveling to South America for six months, you know, how do you, how do you decide on and what's the process you go through when you say, look, we're going to travel for six months. How do you know that six months is a good amount of time? You know, do you look at, you know, visa restrictions and all those sorts of things, or is it, is it monetary or what is it? Basically, how do you know, when it's a good time to come home, because that's a conversation that we're having at the moment where, you know, since we've been talking to people and letting them know that we'll be traveling next year, the the first question they ask is, oh, how long are you going for? And Brooke and I have been really reluctant to to tell people about, you know, a specific time frame because, A, we don't want to see it as, you know, a failure if we come home, you know, before that time. But... The second reason is we, we actually just don't know. We don't know until we're over there. So I guess the question is when you're, when you're traveling, how do you know, you know, when's the best time to come home? Yeah, that's a good question. And I'm trying to think, as you were asking, I was trying to think back about like my mentality in 2011. And I think that six months was a really nice time period for us, especially back in 2011 when we went on that first trip, because we were always planning to come home. Like it was like, okay, we're going on this trip. It's going to be this backpacking post-university trip Mm -hmm. and then we'll come back. So I think money was a factor. Travel insurance was a factor. Six months is like the amount of time that they'll give you for travel insurance mm. and that your health care doesn't expire in Canada. So it's like a really nice period to be away. We just put our cell phones on hold at that point to keep our same numbers. It was like $25 a month at that point to do that. They would only do it for six months. Mm. So I feel like there was all these things that kind of just made six months a good amount of time. And then because six months was a good amount of time the first time, I think that's kind of where we got it the second time. But when we were coming back home from South America, I was actually not ready to come home at that point. I think that had I had more money, had I thought to just call up Alberta Healthcare and say, is there a way for me to extend this? I probably would have stayed because I really wasn't at a point where I was was ready to come home. Yeah, both times we traveled, we ended up feeling... At the end of it, like, okay, we could stay and keep doing this for longer. The first trip, we were, like, really out of money. <laughs> so we needed to come out for that one. The second trip, we weren't, like, quite as out of money. But, yeah, I, I can't remember why we were just, like, we just kind of felt like, oh, six months, that's, like, how long you can travel for. Mm. Yeah, I feel like my parents were like, oh, you can't be out of the country for longer than six months. And I was like, okay, great, I'll go for six months then. But our <laughs> most recent trip in Asia, we were actually gone for eight months. And I, I hit that point somewhere between the six and eight month mark. I was like, hit, like, okay, I'm ready to come home now. So maybe somewhere between six and eight months is a good is a good amount of time to is be away. It's the sweet spot. Yeah. yeah absolutely. So you just took sort of reflecting on, you know, the, the trips that you've done. 2011, as you've mentioned, that was the big backpacking trip where you sort of went around the globe to what you almost touched on all the continents, really, as a lot of Australians do as well and, and New Zealanders. And then in 2013, it was a different sort of trip. So um, tell us about your philosophy and how that maybe that's changed Um, your travel philosophy and how how that's changed over time. Yeah, so we were really, really tired after our first trip. As you can imagine, going to, uh, I think it was like five continents we hit on that trip. So it was just absolutely, or maybe four continents, four continents. It was absolutely insane, like 30 countries or something like that. And, you know, three or four nights in a place, some places were less, Some places were more, but not many were more than three or four nights. So we're just moving constantly. It was a lot of packing and going and sitting on trains or buses or planes, lots of jet lag because we traveled literally around the world. But we were young. We were 21 and 22. So we're like, okay, you know, we can handle this. But, you know, a couple of years later, we were like, okay, let's slow this down a little bit. So we were very intentional about being a little bit slower with our trip. So Mm. when we decided to go to South America, we said we'll only do you know, we'll do less countries. We'll have about a month in each country. I think Uruguay was the exception to that. 
and we'll just be able to get to know the country a little bit more. I think that we still went pretty fast on that trip, but it was slower than our first trip. Yeah. And so the the first time, because we were 21, we just got out of college and, you know, we'd basically gone through, you know, public school system straight into college. It was kind of just like this gigantic extended weekend and <laughs> you're moving around, going out a lot and just having a lot of fun. And it, it really stayed, it continued to be fun for the entire time. But when we get to South America, we went in thinking like, okay, we should, you know, travel slower, um, spend more time in each place, but still we're moving around quite quickly compared to what we do now. But I think for both of us, we quickly noticed maybe after a month, once we'd kind of unpacked like all the stress that we'd accumulated from two years of uh, working in careers that we didn't find particularly meaningful or interesting, we kind of unpacked that and, and both kind of felt this dissatisfaction with just moving from place to place and mm. seeing things. It was cool. It was interesting. It was nice, but something was missing. And so for me, really learning Spanish was something that I was finding a lot of meaning from. And so I decided, you know, we should stop somewhere, go to Spanish school, stay longer, really focus on learning a language to kind of get the sense of meaning that was missing. And so the, one of the kind of big lessons I've learned as I've traveled more is that, you know, you won't enjoy yourself if you're just seeking relaxation all the time, hmm. which is something I think a lot of people kind of can conceptualize, but still are, are driven to. So when you think going backpacking for six months, I'm going to have no responsibilities. I'm going to have fun. But after kind of like four to six weeks, you feel this kind of void. And so for us in South America, it was really experiencing that and, and needing to slow down the travel so that we could do things that gave us more meaning and, and brought a sense of fulfillment to the trip, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And something that I can absolutely relate to, I think that it's really, really important when you're traveling to, yeah, to, to use a, a, an often said phrase, to live like a local. And, and that is, you know, experiencing the culture and, and to an extent where you're in fully immersed, like learning a language. Have you guys ever looked at, and maybe um, your recent trip to Asia, you may have um, also experienced this, is helping out in communities where you know you might not be in a in a first world country, so you, you there's that balance of your your holidaying in a country that you know might not be as financially stable as as the ones you've left. Do you like to work within communities to to help them in in any way while you're traveling? Have you ever experienced anything like that? Yeah, that's been something that I was interested in a lot when I was a teenager and then into my early 20s. And so when we were in South America, we stayed a dead language school in Cusco in Peru, just right near like the starting point for Machu Picchu. And we would spend our mornings doing language school. And then Ryan continued doing language school in the afternoons. And I actually went to a local school and helped out with them. It was like an after school program. So the kids would come and we do arts and crafts and we play games outside and that sort of thing. And it was in a very rural community, about 30 minutes outside of Cusco. You know, the kids were, were not from wealthy families at all. All of them were super cute, but no shoes, super dirty. Um, but they just loved playing and making crafts. And, and that was my most recent experience with working with uh, locals, like dedicating my time, like volunteering my time to do that. And it was a really meaningful experience. Yeah, because I guess it touches on something that Ryan mentioned is that you, if, if you're not there for, for a long time, you don't get to appreciate and connect with people and build those relationships with the community. Because for me, travel is, is about building relationships. It, it might not be, you know, ticking boxes about going and seeing a museum or going and seeing a, a monument or it, it's about the people rather than the stuff if you know what I mean. So what are the, what are the, some of the sort of friendships that I guess you guys have, have developed while you've been traveling and, and, and are they meaningful friendships and do you still keep in touch with people? Yeah, definitely. We have a really good friend who's actually Australian who we first met in Greece. And since then we've connected with him on three different continents. Wow. He's been on our podcast like four times because he just continues. He travels more than we do actually, but he's, been on this continuous backpacking trip for like two years now and it's been really cool seeing him grow as a person through his travels um, but he's somebody who you know we met on a rooftop in Athens 
on our intro night for Kentucky and our relationship is so much more meaningful than than what that sounds like now and he's he's somebody that I'm still quite close with so that's a friendship that I'm really grateful for we've also met um met lots of people in one country that we've been able to meet up with another country. Mm. So something that was really great about traveling Europe was we met a ton of Australian people. And then when we went to Australia, we had all these friends that we were able to meet up with in their hometowns and get more of this like local Australian experience. Mm. Um, so that's been really neat. And then we've met some other people who do a lot of what we do, kind of live nomadically or either travel bloggers or work remotely. And we've been able to connect with them around the world. And those friendships are always, always really meaningful. Yeah. And one of the cool things about traveling a lot is that you have a lot of opportunities to then go visit people that you've met traveling at other points in time. So especially for us, the last few years, we've been moving so many places, had quite a few people from back in the past, whether that was our first trip, meeting them in Australia or more recently from South America trips, but just all these people who you're able to connect with through Facebook now that allows you to kind of keep these relationships that you with people that you meet traveling mm. and maintain them and then say, oh, hey, you guys are both like in Japan right now. Like, let's go out and grab coffee. Let's have lunch. So we've certainly had quite a few kind of friendships that we've formed while traveling that we've been able to maintain. There are, though, I think one of the great things about traveling is just your ability to meet so many people in such a short period of time because people are so open to making new friends. And so, you know, when you're at home and you start talking with someone in a cafe, you're probably not going to take that anywhere unless, you know, you're looking to get a date or something like that. <laughs> but when you're traveling, there's kind of this like built in context, right? Like you meet people at hostels, you start talking finding out more about them. Maybe you guys go out for dinner, maybe like have a drink afterwards and you get to have all these like really deep conversations that you never have with people at home. And that's something that, you know, the first two times you're traveling when we're staying largely in hostels, you have so many great conversations that go deeper than a lot of conversations you have with friends, with people you've maybe met and seen like two times or three times. Mm -hmm. And some of those people you stay in contact with, some you don't, but you do get this like really fulfilling conversation through travel. And it's, it's kind of this weird thing because it's once people separate themselves from, you know, maybe their social circle back home, they're not judging people as much. Maybe they've quit their job. So they're not relying on that as like kind of their core of their identity. Mm. And so they're more open to having these interesting conversations. But even with people, even traveling with people who ha haven't necessarily built long term friendships with, there's just like so much interesting social value that we've gotten because of our time traveling. Totally agree. Absolutely agree. Do you think that those relationships are harder or easier when you travel as a couple? I mean, uh, when I've sort of traveled um, solo, I found that it was a lot easier to, to build those friendships and relationships with, with everyone, really. Do you guys get that sense as well when you travel? Yeah. So we've both taken solo trips. We both did it in 2015, actually. We're just thought it would be an interesting way to, to get a different perspective on travel and get personal developments. We both took solo trips and you definitely find so much more that people are open to engaging with you when you're just by yourself. Mm. I think there may be something like intimidating about a, being in a couple. Mm. And also you have that kind of crutch to lean on. So if it's like, you know, 8 p.m. and you're staying in a hostel and you're by yourself, you're kind of maybe a bit lonely and you there's a strong motivation to just go out down to like the the bar or try to meet up with someone new. Whereas if you're in a couple, it's easier to just say, oh, maybe let's just like hang out tonight. Let's go get dinner somewhere. Let's just spend time between the two of us. And I also think there's something about people feeling comfortable approaching you. So I think we end up hanging out with a lot more couples when we travel as a couple. Yeah, I would agree with that. It's kind of interesting because I've done my first, very first European backpacking trip was with it was only two weeks long, but it was with two of my roommates at the time. And I found that we met people really, really easily because it's, you know, we're three young girls. It's like lots of people are willing to talk to us and hang out with us. Mm -hmm. And then I've been on another trip since then with just one other girl. And again, I found it was like a lot of people were willing to engage with us. Brian and I, you know, seem to hang out with a lot of couples like he mentioned. But I think when you're in hostel dorm rooms, you do kind of attract more people than if you're not staying in those dorm rooms. Like if you're in a private room, obviously you don't have that like forced social interaction. Mm. But I found that on my solo trip, I met a girl. Um, I was doing my yoga teacher training and she was on my second flight over from 
Taipei to Bali. And we just immediately became like best friends and we're still super, super close friends. And I think that that friendship really was able to grow in a way that it wouldn't have grown if Ryan had been there. So I think that like being on my own really allowed me to be open with her. It allowed me to like spend more time with her to like build that relationship over the month that I spent with her. Whereas like if Ryan had been there, I probably would have interacted with her again, of course, but I don't think our relationship would have been as bonded, I guess you could say. Yeah. You guys have obviously traveled extensively over the past five to 10 years. What, what have you learned about yourself over that time? And and perhaps also reflect on what you've learned about each other. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> the things I've learned about you came to mind first. <laughs> the things I've learned about myself. I am not very nice when I'm hungry. So I've learned to, like, hanger is a real thing in my life, and that's not pleasant for anyone, including myself. So I always bring snacks. Having alone time is really important. I think both of us would say that we've probably learned that. And just being able to communicate that, I think it's important with anyone that you're traveling with, whether or not it's somebody that you're romantically involved with or just like your best friend. Um, but to be able to be like, hey, you know what? I just need to like plug my headphones in and not talk to you for a little bit. Or I just need, you know, to spend this afternoon by myself. Mm -hmm. And I think that was one of our biggest growings as a couple and one of my biggest independent personal developments was just, you know, learning to say those things when I needed to. And then also respecting when Ryan needed that space as well, if I didn't need it. So I think that's a big one. Learning that you don't need to see everything was a big thing for me <laughs> on our first trip. I had, you know, these massive lists of things I wanted to see and do, and I was consistently adding to it. And I'd kind of end up getting this FOMO if we missed something and feeling like I was a travel failure. And that's just such a, I don't know. I think it's kind of like a dangerous place to almost get into because you kind of lose the purpose of travel mm. because you become so caught up in all these things that you should see and do. So I think those are some big ones for me. Yeah. Bit. For me, it's just, there's just so much. Um, I think I, I, I was trying to think like, okay, how much of my self knowledge can I attribute to traveling? And it's probably just a, a massive amount mm. for me. Traveling has, I've always enjoyed going places and, and, you know, using travel as a way to see new things, to experience new cultures. But for me, a, a big part of it as well is just leaving home. So it's always been something that I've used as a really introspective time. You know, I bring a ton of books. I do a lot of reading. I do a lot of journaling, especially when we were in South America and we'd gone through this period of time where I was, you know, not feeling super thrilled with life. It was really about introspection for me. So I'd, we'd spend, we'd have these marathon bus rides in South America and I would, you know, listen to podcasts about things and then just sit there and think or have these marathon journaling sessions where I kind of just break down moments from the, you know, basically my entire life before that had been bothering me, but I hadn't really taken the time to think about because when you're at home, there's so much stuff going on, whether it's work or social commitments or family stuff, you don't really have this time to be free of all that. And so traveling gives, gives you this wonderful sense of space that allows you to kind of analyze and look at your life at home in a way that maybe you can't perceive it when you're there. And so for me, especially as a young person, so much of my identity and who I thought I was was connected to the, the small little bubble that I was in. And so leaving that gave me so much perspective on on what my life was like before, what I wasn't enjoying, what I what was really tearing me up and gave me a lot of perspective on how I wanted to change things. So that, that's kind of a bit more abstract answer to the question. But yeah, so much stuff have, has been learned through travel for me. And then as far as a couple goes, especially when you're traveling for an extended period of time, like Amanda and I have talked about this quite a few times, how we, in that six months of backpacking together, we spent 98% of that time together. We probably spent more time together as a couple there than a lot of people do over the course of a decade. If you're <laughs> you know, going to work 50 hours a week, <laughs> And you see your your partner for a few hours a night. It's so true. We saw each other all the all the time, which meant, you know, it was fun a lot of the time, but it also stirred up like all kinds of stuff. Basically, like all the arguments that might have transpired over the course of like 20 years of our relationships happened in six months of like being scattered and trying to get on a train and tr can't find a spot. And then we end up like, you know, yelling at each other about that or like one of us wants to take a tour, one doesn't. Um, so or I'm hungry. Yeah, I mean, it, it massively <laughs> helped our conflict resolution skills. I, I know so much about how Amanda responds to stress because I've seen her in so many stressful situations and we know how to work together through that stuff. Mm. 
So yeah, it's been massively beneficial for our relationship as well. I've got so many questions to come out of that, Ryan. Um, but I want to focus. <laughs> I want to focus specifically on the length of travel, really quickly, because do you guys take short short trips as well, or is it? Do you guys prefer to to travel for a longer period of time? We've definitely played around with both because we. I mean, we went through this two years where we were working. So we were on a Monday to Friday, nine to five schedule. And we spent a lot of time kind of traveling. We lived in Calgary at that point. So traveling to the mountains, to Banff and Canmore, where we now call home, hiking, skiing, going into interior British Columbia, taking short road trips down to the US. Um, I took a tr- trip to Peru, which kind of inspired our entire South America trip. Um, so we definitely did take mm. those shorter trips at points. And then when we got back from South America, we moved into the mountains and we were kind of pretty much stationary for about 15 months. And I think at that point, we each took our one month solo trip and we took like one weekend trip to Jasper. And I think that's all the travel we did in that year. Mm. Is that right? Yeah. So I went to Central Europe for a month by myself and Amanda went to Bali by herself for a month. So that's kind of more of that like middle distance travel. But I think for the most part, we're especially me, really like all or nothing people. Yeah, right. So yeah. <laughs> kind of been like it's very just going to work straight for two years and then quit everything and go travel for six months, and then come back and do it again for a year and then swing back to the other side of the pendulum. I think something that, and, and obviously depending on what your your work situation is like, like not everyone can tra- just take six months off mm. and travel. Not everyone's willing to like bust their ass and save all their money and, you know, miss out on all the things with their friends to be able to do that. And, and that's okay. Everyone can do, can travel how they want to travel. But I think for us, that period of time was, those trips were almost unfulfilling. It's like, I would just start to decompress and just start to relax. Mm. And then it'd be like, oh, work's starting to get in two days. And now I've got, I'm stressed about how many emails are in my inbox because I've had my out of office on for 14 days. Like, is it going to be 100, 400, 1,000? Like, I don't even want to deal with Monday. And I found like, you know, I would just get to this place where I was like, yeah, I feel so good. Like, this is how I felt like on the road. And then boom, stress would hit again. And so for me, those types of trips weren't, quite as fulfilling as the longer ones. But something that was interesting, so the last trip we did, we went to Asia. And this was the first time that we were both working and traveling at the same time. Mm. So we kind of, it's kind of weird in a way because we were traveling and then we kind of took vacations from that trip. So, you know, we spent a month in Chiang Mai, had an apartment and really were settled there. We were focused on our work. You know, we were going out and seeing things on the weekend, maybe after work checking out some local stuff, eating good food. But then we were able to take a trip and go spend 16 days in Myanmar and then come back and kind of settle into Indonesia and spend two months there doing more of the the work-focused stuff. So we have kind of moved more in that direction where we're still kind of people who enjoy moving around pretty consistently, Mm -hmm. but the the lengths of time we're spending places are increasing. So, you know, we like to go somewhere now and spend like three to six months there. And then maybe when we decided we want to move on to the next place, we'll go in a shorter span of time and see a few other places and then settle down somewhere else. I really want to talk now about this um, digital nomadic life because essentially that's what we'll be doing. Uh, Brooke and I will be still be working when we travel to Canada next year. We're going to, we've got you know two kids and, there's going to be obviously a push pull factors with homeschooling them as well as, you know, working in, you know, in servicing clients that are back here in, a, in Australia. What are your sort of tips and, and how, I guess, the most recent trip to, to Asia is, is the best example when you, where you've been working? What, what are some of the challenges that you guys found that were both obvious, but maybe some that you didn't even expect? Yeah, I think the biggest one for me was arriving somewhere new and having this automatic pull to go see stuff because that's what as travelers, like we love seeing stuff and we love experiencing culture and eating that food. And so it was like we would arrive and I was so used to like dropping my bags and going to get a meal or like going to see something and getting a meal. And I found that that was a little bit tainted by this fact of like, oh, I've been on a plane for five hours or I've been on a bus for seven hours or we've been traveling all day and I really need to do some work. So having that like draw to do things and then 
also having that like need to work because if you don't work, you don't make money. If you don't make money, you can't keep traveling. Mm. Um, that was the biggest challenge for me. And I felt that the way that we were able to get around that was having a little bit more preparation around travel days, first of all. So either prepping so that when I got there, I didn't have to stress about work or knowing in my mind, okay, we're going to get there. I've got to get these things done or Ryan needs to get these things done. Then we're going to go for a meal and we'll like explore the next day. Uh, but also having this like slower travel was really, really key for us in order to balance that. So not feeling this like, oh, we only have three days in this place and I have to work every single day. It was, well, you know, we're here for a month. So if I don't go see something right now, it's not a big deal. I'll see it in a day or two days. Not a big deal. I'm going to see it. Mm, yeah. And so I think at least when I was thinking about traveling, this idea of working and traveling at the same time, I'd kind of like idealized it in my head and I was like, okay, this is going to be perfect. It's going to be magical. It's going to be the best of both worlds. And it really is something different than anything that we had experienced before. Something that was that I, I've kind of thought about after experiencing this was something that was great. And one of the, the things I enjoyed a lot about a long-term backpacking trip was this massive sense of freedom that you get if you quit your job and you're you know, your only responsibility is enjoying yourself. And when you're traveling and trying to balance work with that, you know, you've got all those responsibilities. You don't really get to disconnect in that same way, especially because whether it's using email or having to do Skype calls and stuff like this, it gives us this ability to work from farther places, but it also kind of ties us back home. Mm. We don't get to like cut those cords and have that sense of space, which can be one of the best parts about travel. And so for us, as we got into it, we realized that we weren't going to be able to enjoy the travel part of our lives unless we really had the work part of our lives under control. So, you know, we overdo it at the start, having travel fun experiences and realized like, OK, a lot of these days I'm not even enjoying myself because I feel guilty about things I haven't done or mm. I haven't got everything organized back at home. So just becoming more and more organized and maybe like regimented, but not in a bad way, just about how, OK, Right now, I'm work focused, and at the end of the day, we're going to go out and explore something. But um, this week's really going to be focused on work, and then this weekend, we're going to go out and explore something new. And oh, like Amanda said, over the course of a month, we're going to have more and more opportunities to go see stuff. Um, but it's not going to be a thing that we have to feel like we're doing every single day. Yeah, so it's interesting. It sounds like you guys you, you're chunking your work to a certain extent. So you you're you're working you know three or four days and then you'll give you give time to to then be able to go out and, and enjoy you know the travel destinations that you want to go to did you ever get really unrealistic um, deadlines while you while you were traveling and or calls in the middle of the night or or things like that or how how did you get around uh, you know not having that that sort of uh midnight phone calls or unrealistic deadlines? I did a couple like late night phone calls. I think I had one that was at 1230 and one that was at 1am. And I just like didn't tell the people that it was that late for me. <laughs> <laughs> people just assume like I sound North American. They they know, you know, you're Canadian, you're on like Mountain Standard Time. And I'm like, mm, I'm, in, I'm in Asia, but that's okay. <laughs> but, but so for us, you know, something we, we were lucky to have, but also we're very intentional about setting up our lives in, in that way were having very few externally placed responsibilities. Mm. So, you know, one of the gigs that we do um, requires us to be available during the evening in North America. But since we were in Asia, so that's 12 hours opposite, which means we could just get up in the early, you know, 7 a.m. Mm. to 10 a.m. or to noon. And those were the really only commitments we had during the day. So with our podcast, you know, we get to make a decision about when we schedule podcast interviews. So if we want to interview someone who's like big and lives in North America, you know, we get to say, OK, yeah, we're going to get up and interview you at 530 a.m. just to make this work. Mm. But it's, you know, it's us choosing to do that. It's not something that's externally placed on us. And then so much of our other work for me doing podcast production is very, very time flexible. I'll have a deadline, but I can stay up late one night if I want to do it or do it other points during the day. But very few uh, opportunities where things can kind of come at us and say, OK, you need to be online at 2 a.m. in Asia. We were lucky in that way, but also kind of planned it out to make sure that we would have that flexibility and freedom. And I think just like letting people know as well, like I, mm. I manage a yoga studio remotely and I am not actually sure if my boss ever really knew what time it was my time because he'd consistently be like, what time is it over there? But it's kind of just this, 
like there's never an expectation that I have to respond to something right away. So oftentimes I would, you know, wake up to a bunch of emails from him that I had sent the night before that he'd responded at some point during his day. But he was never upset with me because I wasn't responding in the middle of the night or anything like that. Like he knew I was in Asia. We totally had that conversation. He was cool with me being over there as long as I got my work done. And there was never anything that was such an emergency that you know, having it dealt with six hours later was a massive issue. Yeah. And that was actually something uh, that was interesting for me is when you're at home, if you get an email, you kind of feel this pull like, oh, I should probably respond to this pretty quickly because they might be wondering why I'm not responding to it. Mm. But when you're in Asia Asia for eight months and we're exactly opposite to North America, very quickly people's expectations are set. And, you know, I was clear when I was emailing with someone new that, oh, hey, I'm in Asia. It's going to I reply in the morning very quickly. People realize, okay, this person's in Asia. They're not going to reply to me right away. They're going to reply to me in the morning, which means that for you, when you wake up in the morning there and if someone sends you an email or whatever, whatever time it is, you wake up and then you've got basically all day to deal with mm. because you know, that person's asleep. They're going to wake up at 6 AM and check their email. But that means I don't have to do anything until 6 PM. So you've kind of <laughs> got all this freedom because uh, because you are working during the night for other people. So it's kind of this a great thing where it's kind of like being a night owl, but you get to do it during the day if, you're, <laughs> if your time zones are set up right. That sounds like it could be quite addictive. I just might tell my clients right now that I'm in uh, North America and, and, and still have that luxury of a day's grace. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's actually kind of amazing because you have like, I, I found that my days would be really productive because all my emails would be like in my inbox in the morning. So I could spend all the time dealing with them or being like, okay, I know I've got all this time to deal with them. Mm. And I got almost no email communication during the day. It was actually kind of funny. One of my best friends had a baby in January. And so she wasn't sleeping for the first like six months of which time I was away. So she was the only person I ever heard from uh, because it was like the middle of the night in North America, but it was like daytime for me in Asia. And we had this really great thing going on because she's like, wow, I can't talk to anyone. You know, I've been watching this giraffe who's supposed to have a baby, you know, on the TV at the Calgary Zoo. And she's like, it's so boring because this baby's just like feeding and not sleeping. But she had me to talk to and I had her to talk to because I didn't hear from anyone else during the day. So sometimes it works. Absolutely. Out. So guys, tell me, what do you want to get out of, of traveling? You've, you've reached the stage where you're, you're now able to, to live that a digital nomadic lifestyle. What's the end game for you? What what do you want to get out of it in the end? I mean, I, I will I will sort of preface this with the fact that you actually live in the part of the world where we're travelling to and is our home away from home. So why would you ever want to leave there? That's what I want to know. Winter. <laughs> Winter is coming. <laughs> it's here. Winter is coming. So yeah, for example, like we're, you know, we live in Canmore, a beautiful place, but it's September 11th today. Mm. And the trees have turned and are falling off. The leaves are falling off the trees. They're starting to turn. That makes me and like, so excited. <laughs> and it's not <laughs> uncommon for it to have snowed here. So in 2014, on September 1st, there was about a foot of snow. Uh, 2015, there was snow around this time. I, it wouldn't, it, I wouldn't bet a lot of money that we would see snow next week, but I also wouldn't bet a lot of money that we wouldn't. Mm. So, yeah, we've just never been huge winter people that kind of attributes it to a little bit. But uh, I think for me too, I've always kind of felt like an outsider in most situations I am. I'm in, I've never really been happy in one place for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And so I I feel like I kind of feel nourished in a way by moving around and seeing new things. I think it keeps me more present in life by moving around and not getting into these like really deeply ingrained habits. And, you know, we're still, you know, we're in our later twenties now. Um, so I'm sure at some point, maybe a decade from now, we, this might wear off, but, uh, we don't really have an end game other than just keep enjoying ourselves and doing what makes us most happy. And since we both built all this freedom into our lives, Mm. when you're like, Oh, I can just live wherever I want. It doesn't make any sense to me to stay in the same place. Yeah. It's, it's kind of interesting because so, I grew up in Alberta. I grew up not far from Canmore, about an hour east towards Calgary. And you know, my parents were asking me, it's, it's kind of become not, are you going again, but when are you going and where are you going? Mm. So I think our, our family and friends have kind of like caught on to this now because this will be the third of the last four winters that we have successfully escaped. 
And, you know, my dad's like, are you just going to do this forever? And I was like, well, you know, forever is a long time. Like I'm, I'm 28. I've got a lot of life left to live, hopefully. So, you know, this is what we're doing for now. And it's making us happy. Mm. And when it's not making us happy anymore, we'll probably switch it up and not do it. And he's like, well, you're just never going to experience winter again. And I was like, we need to put this in perspective. I spent 25 years of my life living full time <laughs> in Alberta. I was like, that's a lot of winter. Mm. That is a lot of winter. I was like, I need a break from winter. And when I crave snow again, we'll be back. <laughs> yeah. And so for us, like motivating us in the midterm, both of us really, really love um, sp the Spanish language and kind of Latin culture. So since we went to South America, we thought like, oh, it'd be really cool to be more settled somewhere and have an experience where we can really learn Spanish and, and you know, get involved more in that culture. So we're spending this winter in Mexico City. Most likely we might move if we're not actually liking it that much, but that's our plan at least. So we can learn Spanish and, and get, get to fluency, mm. get to learn the culture more and have delicious Mexican food. But there's so many places like that, places now that we've traveled to something close to 50 countries Over where 50 you've, countries. You know, you've seen them and thought like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we could live here and get to know like what it's really like to live in this place mm. and now we have that flexibility and the freedom that we can do that. So there's just like so many exciting places to go that, you know, for at least the next like five years, I don't see us really finding a place to settle down. But that said, I think part of what motivates us as well is trying to find a place that really feels like home. And we've been able to meet great friends from all around the world. But something that you lose out on when you're traveling is this you know, sense of steady community. Mm. Um, so if we did find a place where, okay, you know, quite a few of our friends live here, it's meets all of our needs and, you know, we can still travel part of the year. I think we would definitely settle down somewhere like that, but haven't found a place that really does it for us. Canmore's almost there. Yeah. Canmore's almost there. <laughs> so tell me where, um, where are you guys going to spend the winter? Where, where's the next trip? Yeah, so we're heading down to Mexico City mid-October, mm -hmm. and we have three weeks booked in an Airbnb there to kind of feel it out, see what the scene is like there, see if we like it. Um, we've heard great things, so we really hope we do like it, and if we do, then we'll stay for probably at least a couple months, if not up to six months, which is what we have in the country in one time, mm -hmm. um, probably find a place to live and, and do that whole thing. If we don't like it, we'll check out some other places in Mexico we don't like Mexico, I don't know what the plan is after that, but <laughs> the world is our oyster. Oh, absolutely. The world is your oyster. And it sounds like, you know, you guys, world wanderers are moving out of Canmore and uh, the McCalories are going to be moving in. Um, so, guys, I I just wanted to say thank you very, very much for, for joining me. I and Brooke both love your travel philosophy. It's something that we are working on and we hope to perfect as well as you guys have and i just wanted to say thank you very much for for your time and and thanks for joining me yeah, yeah of course absolutely. thank you so much for having us on yeah thank you All right, guys, there's the interview with Ben from the Slow Your Home podcast. Make sure you guys go check them out as well. They have some awesome stuff. And if you've been looking to slow your life down a little bit in this crazy, hectic world, they've got lots of lots of awesome content on that. As always, you can find us at www.theworldwanders.com for show notes and resources. You can find us on social media at The World Wanders Podcast on Instagram and Facebook and we would invite you to join our private Facebook community. It's called World Wanders, a community for travelers. You can go request to come in. We'll approve you right away. We'd love to have you there. As always, thanks so much for listening and we'll see you next week.